And yeah, so it's a pleasure to have um, Professor uh, uh, Mazar Ali uh, with us today to give us our um, condensed matter seminar. Um, so Mazar is the Alexander von Hel uh, Humboldt and Sophia Kobelyaske uh, Gaia, um, I, I can't pronounce this, uh, this name, um, group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Halle, uh, that's, that's the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure. Um, he, um, he's had a very illustrious um, career. Uh, he's worked on a range of um, topics um, that cover, um, for example, um, a very famous material tungstenite telluride in its bulk form and large magnetoresistance, resistance, but also um, a, a, a large number of quantum geometric materials as well. Um, uh, kind of interestingly, uh, uh, Mazar um, ha has also not only just uh, done research, but he's also kind of dabbled in startups as well. Um, so he was a chief scientist of uh, Ketos, uh, uh, which kind of monitors uh, drinking water quality. And uh, he, he's also in, in, um, involved in a startup in, uh, called Material Mind uh, that uses AI to find um, uh, novel materials. Um, so, so, so he'll, he'll, he'll tell us in this very kind of interesting title that he has right now about um, how you can go from Silicon Valley to, to dark matter. Um, uh, and hopefully that route is through quantum materials. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, welcome Mazar to uh, our Condensed Matter Seminar. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Uh, it's very nice to be here. And thank you guys for the invitation to speak at your uh, Condensed Matter Seminar. And uh, correct, actually, yeah, uh, that the route from Silicon Valley to dark matter is indeed through quantum materials. It's, it's the wave of the future, as I think you guys are very well aware of. So yeah, I'm gonna talk, uh, basically I'm gonna tell you guys a few stories. Um, relating to this type of research, how it's done, and some of the things we found along the way with some, let's say, I mean, ending up at dark matter, for example, some sort of unexpected twists and turns in terms of applicability of, of the type of research we do. So, um, like I said, the brief outline, will go through the research flow. Um, then some, of course, some basic background, the usual and topology, symmetry, and physical properties, very, you know, high level. Um, nothing too too deep there. And then I'll get into the stories. Uh, the first will be a fundamental story about tungsten ditelluride and sort of how we came about it and uh, some of the things that have been seen. And uh, then the second story will be about some of the work I did when I was at IBM uh, in Almaden in California. So this was in San Jose and uh, this is where the Silicon Valley starts to come in because that was my first exposure to industrial research rather than purely academic. And then uh, I'll focus on some recent uh, discoveries that we've been working on, which is centered around higher topology and using Josephson junctions as a probe. So using superconductivity to probe the, the intrinsic properties of materials. Um, but I'll also talk a little bit about another avenue we're going down now, which is we call them, I mean, it's known as emergent behavior. So basically where uh, the combination of properties can result in yet another new property that didn't come about due to either of the, let's say, initial two properties. So in this case, it has to do with triangular lattice plus Dirac electrons makes a fancy anomalous Hall effect. And then finally, like I said, I'll talk about uh, dark matter and how we're basically starting now to build a, uh, our version of a dark matter detector based on um, axon insulators or axon semi-metals. So um, the basic research flow, because I understand that not everybody's familiar with uh, the sort of path from solid state chemistry to condensed matter physics. So we say that it starts with, you know, figuring out some interesting idea. Um, sometimes it's from basic understanding. Very often it's from collaboration with people like Justin. Um, I'm an experimentalist, so I work very closely with uh, theorists and the usual sort of feedback loop. And it's, it's fundamentally important to how we come up with you know, interesting materials and interesting directions to look at. Uh, from the idea though, you know, then it starts to come more into our wheelhouse of, of making. So I say my group makes and measures. That's our, that's our tag, tagline, we make and we measure. So when we, I say we make, we literally use you know, these type of muffle ovens, you know, quartz tube ampules with you know, ground together bits of elements inside in an evacuated quartz tube heating in um, various types of furnaces to try to grow crystals or sometimes powders, but ideally crystals and uh, measuring bulk properties in, you know, things like the PPMS, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. 
Now, relatively more recently, the thing we've started doing, which I've been having a lot of fun with over the last three or so years, has been the device level exploration. And again, this is informed by my time at IBM because uh, my background came from a uh, you know, pure bulk uh, investigation uh, when I was a grad student. Whereas of course at IBM in a place uh, like that, they really don't care that much about uh, the bulk properties. They very much care if you it has similar or even better properties in the thin film or thin flake form, because that's important for devices and not just, you know, micro devices, but scale, you know, combined many, 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 many times onto a chip and combining chips, of course, to make your phones, your computers, etc. So uh, we start playing around nowadays with uh, these 2D materials. And this is a, the 2D fab um, that I made here in Halle. And we use an instrument like the Blue Force, uh, which is a dilution fridge to investigate, you know, very low temperature stuff. And the fun thing about this is that you can investigate properties that are not necessarily doable in bulk. And uh, this is where the feedback loop, of course, comes with theory um, quite closely, is that sometimes we make things and we you know, measure uh, often from a direction that's informed by theory. But as I'll mention in a couple of the stories um, as we go, sometimes we find properties that were unexpected, not predicted. And uh, that then informs theory uh, where, you know, tr attempt at understanding the onset of those properties comes in. So, so it's a, it's a perpetual loop that, that helps us all do better. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. I apologize. Um, okay. So some basic background. So of course, uh, topology, I think everybody in the audience is, uh, very familiar with this. So I'll, I'll do a very brief overview. Um, we often use the donut, uh, the, the sphere and donut analogy. So you can envision, or you can see how these two shapes are fundamentally not the same. Um, you know, one way of understanding this is related to the Poincare conjecture. You can imagine wrapping a belt around the sphere and tightening it continuously to a point, you know, essentially sliding it over one end. With the uh, donut or torus, you can't do that. You know, either type of, let's say, wrapping with the belt that you make ends up not being able to be tightened infinitely to a point. If you, tie it, if you wrap it this way, of course, the hole in the center prohibits you. If you wrap it this way, well, you'd have to cut through the shape. So in this way, we say the torus is not hemiomorphic to the sphere. This same idea can be manifested in, a, in electronic structures. So starting with a normal insulator where you have your conduction band, your valence band, and the separation from a band gap, and let's say due to some knob, some tuning knob like bonding strength, we end up with an band inversion. So the conduction band valence band cross. And with the appropriate symmetry and something like spin orbit coupling, for example, you get annihilation at the crossing point. And you end up with a scenario where you've actually returned to having a band gap, right? This has a band gap and the normal insulator has a band gap, but the nature of these two band gaps are not the same. Here you have the band inversion. The conduction band is, uh, the valence band happens to be up in the conduction band. So this is our analogy. You know, this type of insulator is not the same as this type of insulator. This ends up being a topological insulator with a connection here by a surface state. So it's the it's a it's analogous to our sphere in our donut. So how does symmetry relate to all this, or what is symmetry? Well, you know, symmetry, of course, is a way of describing how objects in space are related to each other. There are various types of symmetry or uh, operations, like proper rotations, like threefold, fourfold, sixfold, rotation axes, reflections, etc. And this is manifested constantly in nature. Um, we see this all the time, of course, you know, uh, even just a uh, man-made stuff, a fan blade, of course, is has a clear fourfold symmetry, right? Or a hexagonal um, nut as a six-fold symmetry. And symmetry also tells us about how, again, not just objects in space relate to each other, but let's say fields, right? So the energy, or the, the magnitude of this field at point P is related to you know, P prime through some symmetry operation. And it can help simplify the relation uh, when trying to understand the, let's say the uh, magnitudes uh, of the field at various points, you can sort of take a shortcut if you know something about the symmetry of the field. So in electronic structure, how this manifests is a, uh, understandable in a few ways, but the way I like to use is the, the Roald Hoffman approach. So this idea was first laid out by Hoffman 
um, to sort of blend the chemistry and the physics. So if we imagine like a chain of S orbitals, like a chain of hydrogen, you can imagine that their orbitals are all in phase. So shown by the shaded uh, balls here or out of phase, right? Shaded, not shaded, shaded, not shaded. Then this is the usual, you know, block function times basis set. And the block of course is related to the index K. So K ends up being an index. It's also the momentum. It's also the position in reciprocal space. And so as a function of K, you end up with a different arrangement of the phase of the, of the orbitals. And this is what we call bonding. And this is what we call antibonding. So if we imagine a, the example that's used all the time nowadays, the square, a square lattice. So an arrangement of, in this case, we'll imagine um, atoms that don't just have s orbitals, but also p orbitals in a square, then you can immediately see that if I draw like, the way I did here, the phases of the orbitals as a function of k, at some points, like the m point, which would be k uh, x equals pi over a and k y equals pi over a, you can see that the orbitals are related to each other by a simple 90 degree rotation, i.e. a fourfold rotation. Correspondingly, they are degenerate at that point. So this is what I mean by that shortcut. Symmetry can tell you about degeneracies, for example, in the electronic structure, if you know something about the, the crystal and orbital symmetry. So topology and symmetry together work like this. Crystal plus orbital symmetry drives electronic structure topology, which of course is the point of this talk, will drive various interesting electronic properties. And this is the basis of the topological quantum chemistry um, various work by Bernabeu, Vishwanath, and others. So, so just very briefly, I'm going to talk about a few, just as a, three classes today, but there's kind of a zoo of, of classes of regimes you can end up with. But I'm going to talk about three that have uh, properties that we care about. So again, out of that zoo, and this is not a comprehensive drawing anymore. It, it used to be a bit more, but it's out of date. But um, again, as a function of symmetry breaking, you can end up in different classes of while semimetals, Dirac semimetals, topological insulators, um, nodal line semimetals, which is like a, for example, a Dirac, instead of a Dirac point, you have an entire Dirac line. And this can be related to, you know, high, uh, interesting properties like have, we've seen ultra high mobilities, very high conductivity, the magnetoresistive effects, of course. And probably the most famous, of course, are the spatially localized conduction, like the surface states, edge states, et cetera. So to touch on those three classes very quickly, the topological insulators are where you have the band inversion, but at the edge of, at the boundary, you have a connection between the conduction valence bands via, via surface states or edge states or some kind of boundary localized state. So in 2D, this was manifested as a quantum spin hall insulator, which had a quantized uh, conduction that has been seen a long time ago, actually now. I remember when this was relatively new, but uh, I guess it's been, I'm getting old. So it's been a while, almost 15 years. So cadmium telluride, mercury telluride, um, this, this was seen in 2D and in 3D, instead of edge states, you end up, for example, with surface states, which of course was seen um, by some colleagues of mine in bismuth telluride and many other materials now. And just for an example, this is the ARPES, um, the angle resolve photo uh, emission spectroscopy. And um, this is the bulk band here. And again, the bulk band here, and these are the surface states connecting them, just like essentially in the picture. In Dirac semimetals are very related, of course. Um, again, you have uh, essentially a band touching or inversion, but this time with the addition of a point group symmetry, so like a fourfold rotation, for example, or a sixfold rotation, you can end up sticking or demanding one of these degeneracies. And that results in a fourfold degenerate, you know, locally linear dispersion. So basically, and that's important that you can get very high Fermi velocities. And so uh, this was seen, we saw this a long time ago uh, in cadmium arsenide, um, with, where the, the, the point group symmetry of, of choice in that compound was, uh, again, a fourfold rotation. And as expected, um, we saw just crazy high conductivities with the uh, uh, mobilities, um, electron mobilities that bordered on 10 million uh, semi squared per volt second. So this was actually the crystal. Um, that we measured that in, although it's been 
repeated many times, but my, the reason I show it is that it's just kind of a rock. It's a, it's a nice rock, but it's still a rock that we grew in the lab and it has a mobility comparable to that of you know, freestanding graphene. So the point is that these Dirac semi-metals can manifest these uh, properties um, in you know, relatively impure uh, samples that are not nearly as, um, let's say, touchy as some of the, the classic prototypes. So the three Dirac semi-metals are a very interesting place to, to play around. Topological wild semi-metals, last class we're gonna mention. Hi, Mazur. I, I had a quick yeah. question about that 3 Dirac sem, um, semi-metal uh, cadmium 3 arsenic 2 example that you talked about. Yeah. So, so I understand that there was really, really high mobility there. Um, huh? Has that actually been explained? Um, do people so, understand that? <laughs> or, is it, or is it still Fuan's kind of, you know, kind of vague um, kind of explanation? Vague. Correct. Yeah. Um, there's, it's not settled on an explanation as to why. The, uh, so I won't uh, go into it too much here, but one of the interesting results of this paper, aside from the mobility, was trying to address why. And you know, one of the things we saw was that there was a uh, very much suppressed backscattering. So it, relative to the amount of scattering that was happening in general, um, the, specifically the backscattering was a couple order magnitudes smaller. So there was an idea put forward of some backscattering protection mechanism, um, but it's it's not fully uh, fully explained yet. Okay. So, so yeah, it's a it's an ongoing it's an ongoing question. But people have moved forward with trying to make use of this <laughs> uh, in various types of technologies now. But okay. um, yeah, that's a that's a good point because it it's real. It comes up in more than just cadmium arsenide. So I I think there's something there that is worth really going back and investigating because I think there's some fundamental something fu is fundamentally missing there. And, and it's completely clear material. that this is coming from the bulk and not from the surface states. Yeah, in, in that material, it's it's pretty pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good question. Okay, so uh, it's wild semi metals. Uh, the last uh, section, or the last of these categories, I'm going to talk about. Um, is very similar to direct semi-metals, except this time we're going to also break inversion or time reversal, one of the two. Um, and in that case, you end up with a twofold rather than four, fourfold degenerate state. So you can have, uh, you basically break spin degeneracy. And this has been seen um, in, in inversion symmetry breaking. So you can see because of this uh, pair of atoms here, with the single atom here and the pair rotate by 90 degrees, there is not actually an inversion center in this unit cell, right? And you, you, if you fold those through the inversion, they would basically be where these purple or blue, whatever color that is, um, atoms would be, not over here. So uh, this, this compound, sure enough, would, did exhibit um, wild points and has been, you know, has manifested a few interesting properties um, over the years, including you know these high mobilities and interesting um, orbits related to the the wild points. Uh, more recently, um, time reversal symmetry was broken rather than inversion, and that was done in this Kagome. So keep that in mind, um, cobalt sulfur tin, where you had a ferromagnetic coupling of the cobalt, so you ended up with an overall ferromagnet, which breaks time reversal symmetry, and also ended up with wild. Points. So one thing I, I touch on always, um, which was very important for when I went to, you know, interview at IBM um, and they asked, you know, why should we care about any of this stuff? It sounds awesome in maybe 10 or 20 years, uh, maybe, if you can make interesting thin films out. And the, the, one of the main points I always bring up is why topological quantum materials are interesting for applied physics is a question of dirtiness. So. One of the things I learned um, that I didn't know actually when I started there was the how pure things are <laughs> that you make computer chips out of. Of course, we know and we've seen you know pictures of the uh, incredible clean rooms um, where where the, the various types of films are made, but you don't really think about the idea that the copper buses, the copper interconnects, are at least six nine purity. Um, that's that's kind of ridiculous, especially for the background I was coming from in solid state chemistry, which I'll mentioned in a minute. Or uh, famously, that MGO, the tunnel barrier in um, um, MTJs, magnetic tunnel junctions, you know, famously, it was actually Parkin, uh, Stuart Parkin, who was one of the first to realize that 
MGO was only good as a tunnel barrier, but when it was good, it was exceptionally good, better than anything else, but only when you grew it in very ultra low vacuum. Um, standard practice of sputtering is to deposit in 10 to the minus eights. Um, but it turns out, well, basically people were playing around with it and it was always kind of a crap tunnel barrier. Um, very too much leaking, not good uh, spin polarization selection. But when you make it in extremely high uh, ultra or extremely low vacuum, or sorry, extremely high vacuum, uh, extremely low pressure, it, it works ex much, much better. So one of the, just by contrast in topological materials, right? The bismuth telluride crystals we grew, um, we're not really not that special. Um, the tungsten ditelluride, I mean, we started with 99%, so 2.9 pure tungsten. In a in a in not much pure tellurium, in much you know uh, higher pressure, in cadmium arsenide, you know not even three nines of cadmium, which is known to have other kind of uh, metals dissolved in it. So it really is not very clean, and yet you saw those mobilities, those those properties. So why is this? Well, one of the the jokes we like to make, the tongue in cheek way we we show this is that if you graph the coolness of the properties relative to the perturbation. Um, you apply, so like the dirtiness, the impurity. Well, classical materials just sort of decay rapidly um, in a in a non, um, in not the same fashion as a topological material, which we say, you know, plateaus around uh, to at a level until a perturbation, it's dirty enough that you essentially break symmetry. So it, the exotic properties in topological materials are robust. Um, this is why we say they're, you know, uh, topologically protected until you break that symmetry that held those special features together the the properties stick around and then when they break they they suddenly break you you lose it in a relatively all at once fashion and so this type of behavior is very good for technology for is for quantum technology okay so i'm going to dive into some of the stories now with that background keeping those things in mind so tungsten ditelluride that was a that was a fun um material to, to play with back in the day. And uh, the way it started was that, you know, we understood hexagonal materials, hexagonal symmetry was interesting. <laughs> a lot of interesting physics had a, was known to exist in the hexagonal uh, net family, right? There were, of course, the topological insulators that had been seen uh, back in 2009, bismuth is a hexagonal material. There are many, many superconductors that are known ranging from it, uh, magnesium diboride to the layered chalcogenide superconductors. And, uh, and many other interesting properties, frustrated magnets, et cetera. So an interesting way to think about hexagonal, the classic hexagonal net is in terms of masking certain atoms. So if you mask a certain arrangement of atoms in the hexagonal net, you can end up with a honeycomb, which of course is, you know, is graphene, the prototype, typical uh, Dirac semi-metal, MOS2 and other layered chalcogenides have the same type of structure and again, interesting properties. And if you mask a different set of atoms in the hexagonal net, you can end up with this, the famous Kagome net, which uh, back in the day when, when we started looking at this was mostly um, known for potentially hosting frustrated magnetism, the air dates and things like that. And now, uh, again, cobalt sulfur tin, iron three tin, these are also in the Kagome family. So these are interesting places to look for interesting physics. So, but, one, one issue though, when I, I started looking at this back in the day was that they all are inversion symmetric. They're all centrosymmetric. And it was becoming more and more interesting to ask the question of what happens if you break inversion symmetry um, before we were trying to break time reversal symmetry. So how to try going about doing that in, a mat in materials with these type, of, these type of structural motifs. So the first cut, the first thing we had tried was actually in lead tantalum diselenide, a TMD. And this is what the crystal structure looks like. It's got a really nice hexagonal net of lead, super heavy, a um, lot of spin orbit coupling in this, in, in this layer. But in the tantalum diselenide layer itself, you'll notice that there's no tantalum here. And so this compound is clearly breaking inversion symmetry because of the tantalum diselenide layer. So what happens? Well, it was interesting that it's superconducted and people are still investigating the nature of the superconductivity and that's, that's all fun. And uh, it, in terms of the electronic structure, it behaved kind of as expected. Um, the hexagonal net driven cone um, appeared at K like it's supposed to along with some other tangential or so-called accidental crossings. 
And uh, when you apply spindle brick coupling, because this thing has a lot of it, sure enough, you know, because it's lacking uh, certain types of symmetries, those gap, but you ended up actually with some other extra crossings. And so this compound ended up being the so-called first wild nodal line semi-metal. That's all great, but it wasn't very 2D. It was honestly terrible to try to make good samples of this. It was terrible to try to grow good crystals. Um, pretty quickly, we realized this one is just not going to be a not going to be a winner. But it's an interesting compound nonetheless. But um, I guess, but it's a, it's not easy to play with. So we we moved on, and the, the question came: Okay, how else can we try to try to break symmetry? Um, how else can we try to break that inversion? And so a silly idea popped up, which was to rather than try to break um, symmetry along the c-axis and keeping the hexagon intact, what if you what if you crack the hexagon? What if we, you know, let it deform? Obviously, we'll, we'll lower symmetry a lot. We'll also lose hexagonal symmetry, but maybe some interesting remnants of that symmetry would uh, would persist. So, you know, I went combing through the the, the uh, transition metal dichalcogenides since that's where I was living at the time, um, in my head, I guess. And interestingly, one at well at the time, two. There were two known materials to satisfy that, that request of breaking the hexagon while maintaining the, the 2D van der Waals gap layered symmetry. And uh, in the TMDs, the only two materials that were known to do that at the time were tungsten ditelluride and its sister, molybdenum ditelluride. And uh, only tungsten ditelluride was expected to be the stable ground state. So, you know, we went ahead and made it. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. And so this is how the hexagon cracks. Uh, basically, due to a uh, trick of chemistry, tungsten and tellurium happen to have very, very similar uh, electronegativities. Uh, tungsten is special. It behaves not like its neighbors in, in the uh, trans heavy transition metals. Um, and it likes to bond with itself, uh, which is exactly what happened here. We got a zigzag chain of tung tungsten. And that is what distorted the hexagonal um, tungsten net. And uh, so it ends up being um, orthorhombic and it grows in this, you know, beautiful layered uh, sort of lad, it's called shape. And uh, as expected, um, to some extent, the lowering of the symmetry did indeed keep some interesting, um, let's say aspects, some remnants uh, that persisted in the electronic structure. And so there have been many interesting papers now delving into the nature of the electron structure, but it was basically manifested the first so-called type two wild semi-metal, where in a type one uh, that we talked about before, basically the Fermi surface cross-section cuts through either a circle or a point. In a type two, because the while is coming from essentially tilted pockets, you end up cutting a hyperbola. So that's all well and good. And, um, you know, it manifested an interesting electronic structure topology, like we hoped. But when we started, um, how do we get rid of that? Okay. Anyways, when we started uh, looking at the properties, of course, we found something completely unexpected, which was that the magnetoresistive effect is just enormous, and it shoots pretty much to the moon. Actually, um, there's no signs of saturation up to the highest magnetic fields we were actually able to apply. So, 60 tesla. And uh, it just keeps going. And this had not actually been seen in any known material at the time. Um, and the reason for this lack of saturation, it turns out, is, expla is explainable semi-classically. It turns out that if you have a, a nearly perfect ratio of holes and electrons, you can sit on a pole where the magnetoresistive effect can in increase arbitrarily. Um, and if you deviate from that uh, ratio from nearly perfect, then, then you end up with saturation like had been seen in basically every other semi-metal ever. So this has you know, been a very interesting um, story and a very interesting compound that is still being investigated in all kinds of ways. And we'll touch back on it for something very more recent. But uh, I'm gonna stop there in terms of the history of it and switch to the applied story. So this now is gonna be talking about what something that came up at IBM. So of course, you know, IBM being a industrial company cares about um you know a technological application and uh, one of the most important Andar, just to stop you there a little bit yeah. uh, so panaki yeah. from gupta has a question so oh, panaki, oh, you want to ask a question yeah hi Mazar. can you uh, go back Hello. to the last slide yeah 
just, just uh, one more. Uh, the magnetic resistance. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's this one, yeah. Yeah. Do you understand what those, uh, no, uh, the next one, MR curve? Yeah, uh, this yeah, one. I think there's some lag, that's all. Yeah, yeah. okay. Oh, yeah. sorry, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you understand why uh, these uh, plateau-like things are there uh, at... Uh, these? Yeah, the, these oscillations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So um, they are the so-called Shubnikov de Haas oscillations. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, the quantum limit is, I think, like seventy Tesla. In the, if you calculate, you know, um, the the filling and all that. So it hasn't been hit yet. Um, what'll happen if you go? It, you know, someday I guess we'll get there, and it'll be interesting to to see what happens at a little higher field. But unfortunately, it's just a bit out of reach at the moment. Yeah, so, so just a quick uh, clarification on the MR there, because this kind of came up in a recent uh, um, talk about tungsten telluride from Sanfeng Wu. Um, oh yeah, Sanfeng, right. So, but but um, uh, what's, what's the magnitude of the resistance at those very, very, very high fields? So here you have these percentages, but are, um, uh, is, is it is it mega ohms? Is it? Um, do you, do no, you no. Which I mean, of course. It, so the actual resist the resistivities or the resistances? Um, you mean the resistivity, the resistivities, right? Resistivities. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not in the um, in the mega ohms. No, no, no. So this thing um, is very metallic um, without magnetic field and at low temperature. It's down to the. I think the like maybe couple hundred nano ohm centimeters. So oh. you know, increasing by an order by seven orders of magnitude is still not even an ohm centimeter. You know. I see. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. No problem. Great. Okay. So um, right. IBM spin hall effect. Spin hall effect is super important um to MRAM <laughs> basically. Uh, so you know, next generation spintronic based uh, computation needs uh, spin polarized current. There's a few different ways to try to get spin polarized current, but one of the most popular um, ways uh, that we're trying to do is to use the, the spin Hall effect. And I think everybody knows what that is. So you apply an electric field and you get a uh, spin polarization. And there's a variety of reasons this happens, um, intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms. But what we're gonna talk about is actually based on the intrinsic mechanism. So I'm not gonna go into the, the details about why and how, so I'm, the, the main point is that the intrinsic mechanism is related to the electronic structure. It's not uh, occurring due to scattering events, it's occurring due to phase change um, in between scattering events. So it is proportional to the Berry curvature. And uh, the short story, and there's a lot of reading that can be done about this, but the short story is that the Berry curvature uh, can a source of Berry curvature can be gapped anti-crossing. So what I mean by that is where you have a crossing, uh, in the electronic structure without spin orbit coupling, and then due to spin orbit coupling, a gap forms. If the Fermi level sits basically, you know, near the uh, the uh, equivalence point, then you can have a very large uncompensated Berry curvature. You don't necessarily need to actually have a you know a semiconductor. As you can see, you can have a semi metal that can still do this. So. You know, again, why do we care? Why, why is this important? Why was this important to IBM? So here's a, maybe one of the most basic spintronic devices. The idea is if you have, let's say, two cobalt layers separated by non-magnetic spacer, and this cobalt layer, the blue layer, has a pinned magnetization, okay? And this cobalt layer is pinned in a different orientation. If we pass, uh, if we measure the resistance of this uh, junction, it will be different. If, for example, this layer, the red layer and the blue layer are anti-parallelly aligned versus if they are parallelly aligned. And uh, what we can do is push through a, a spin polarized current by, you know, putting a voltage across this thing. And um, due to conservation of angular momentum, actually, the spins uh, pumped through the non-magnetic spacer that, again, are oriented uh, according to the red layer. When they hit the blue layer, if you pump enough of these spins over, you will flip the magnetization of the blue layer. And so in this way, we can have our two different um, resistive states and a control. 
So this is, again, the basics, one of the most basic spintronic devices. So you, what you would like is as large of a uh, spin hall effect as possible so that at you know, relatively low current densities, relatively low powers, you can switch um, the magnetization of the other, of the other film and, and use this for logic or for computation. So it was known when I was started to work at IBM that you know, there were a handful of materials that, had known, that were known to experimentally have a large spin hall effect. Um, at the time, it was primarily platinum and platinum-based you know, alloys, and one very odd material, beta tungsten. So again, tungsten rears its head, and an oxygen doped version. There had been a lot of speculative work um, that have now been, you know, various levels of confirmed in topological insulators, while semi-metals, and non-clinear magnets. But all of these materials had one important drawback. Uh, the drawback being that there's an entire infrastructure um, set up to make all of your devices, computers and phones and whatever, and they all are based on sputtering, um, physical vapor deposition. So these Platinum, tungsten were the only ones out of all of these that could immediately be plugged into the existing infrastructure to make these type of devices. So again, platinum was known, but actually beta tungsten had been experimentally shown, but it wasn't explained why beta tungsten had such a large spin hall effect. Uh, when I started there, it was it was a puzzle. So naturally, that was that was the assignment to go figure that out. So if you look at its electronic structure, actually, it's it's very very unsurprising. Tungsten, um, once again, in this in the beta version of beta tungsten, um, likes to bond to itself. And so you end up with these, again, infinite chains, not zigzag this time, but linear chains in uh, the three principal directions. And what it, this does is that in the electronic structure, without spin orbit coupling, just like we had hoped, you end up with lots of anticross. And uh, upon applying spin orbit coupling, they gap. And if you calculate the spin hull conductivity as a function of, you know, energy, pretty much exactly where you'd expect at the uh, level that crosses the equivalence point of as many of those crossings as possible, you end up with, the peak, with a peak in the spin hull effect. So it was coming not by random chance, of course, but by the crystal and orbital symmetry effects that we talked about earlier. So what we said was, okay, now that we understand that, if, and if symmetry and is the driver, then other compounds that have the same crystallographic structure and similar orbital symmetries are definitely going to show the same effects. It's a matter of a, a filling factor. So we looked at various other materials in the A15 family. That's the name of the crystal structure. And, uh, and you know, found um, computationally that there were a variety of other good candidates um, that had large spin hall effects uh, comparable to platinum and to beta tungsten. And that one, you know, a simple alloy um, in order to move the Fermi level basically down onto that peak in the spinal connectivity. An alloy with tantalum should actually help us get, you know, a little bit higher, maybe, you know, a few, uh, maybe 10, 20% higher. So, you know, we decided to take a look. So this is one of my other babies, my main um, piece of equipment. This is my sputtering machine um, that I have here in Halle. And so we, as well as a several other groups um, around the world, took a crack at this. We said, oh, well, we should be able to make that. So we did. And, um, you know, we put a paper up, uh, I don't know, last year. And happily, a couple other groups, um, uh, Zhao over in China and Klawi, uh in, uh, in Mainz, took a crack at the same idea um, based off of that, that science advances paper. And all found that, yeah. Alloying with tantalum um, did pretty much what we expected. It increased the, uh, the spin hall conductivity um, roughly by the percentage we, we hoped. And a uh, tangential benefit, um, it lowered the overall resistance of the, of, the, of the alloy. So the tantalum doped version is lower resistance than just the, the tungsten version, which means it lowered the, it allows for even lower um, power. So that was great. And so, you know, this, uh, this is a moderate success that is now being, uh, it's entering what we call wafer scale testing. So what we do, you know, especially us here, we, we do this on like one centimeter scale, you know, it's, it's very academic, it's test. Um, these guys, you know, at the Fraunhofer, for example, uh, they start to do the next step, which is going up to, to six centimeter all the way through the current um, manufacturing scale, which is all the way at 24 centimeters. 
So that means make a uniform film, 24 centimeters in diameter, right? Um, it's, a, it's a tall ask. So, you know, it's still in early stages for this material to reach, let's say, commercial application, but it's, it's taking the next step. It's going out of the lab into, well, the bigger lab. And, uh, you know, it really, you know, there are commercial chips today based on platinum. There are companies like, uh, um, what are they called? Everspin, um, Avalanche, and a few others that literally make a spin hall effect platinum based um, hard, hard drives um, and memory. So, you know, it may be that in five or some odd years, this material, tungsten dope tantalum, may be able to replace platinum and uh, lower the, you know, cost, of course, pretty dramatically of, of making these chips. So that, that's a, that's, that's cool. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But this idea um, of basically recognizing relevant patterns in the electronic structure. Oh, I lost my mouse. Yeah, of recognizing relevant patterns in the electronic structure and, uh, and realizing that through some physical model, you know, they drive a physical property, um, led to the formation of Material Mind, uh, our company, uh, basically where we said, okay, rather than a grad student doing this, you know, it's pretty much pen and paper and a few calculations at a time, um, like we did uh, for that, uh, the Science Advances paper, for example, we, we said, you know, if we combine that with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we, we can scale that up dramatically and expand to a lot of other properties. So that's what the company does. And, you know, it's a bunch of fun. Okay, so to close out, I'm going to tell the last three interesting stories um, that are related to stuff that has happened uh, very recently. So the first is related to this hierarchy topology and JJ's, Joseph's new. So I'm not going to go through, you know, what where higher topology, order topology comes from and whatnot. Um, there are people in the audience much more specialized to do that than me. So I'm just gonna say uh, kind of the results of it all. And one of the results is that there were, you know, topological insulators as we knew, um, which had surface states or edge states in the 2D, um, but there can be further spatial confinement of these, these boundary states. And there can be so-called hinge states and now corner states. So, they're analogous to the topological insulators, but have a further dimensional reduction. So we're gonna focus on the higher order topological semi-metal. So it's like a top, topological insulator, except instead of a, you know, actual band gap that the, uh, the Fermi level can sit inside, it has a continuous gap, so it's a semi-metal, but the Fermi level can't sit inside the entire gap. So WT2, uh, returning to that, it turns out over the years, since people have investigated so much and are still investigating it, it has many topological hats. And in the mono layer, it loses a glide plane um, it, that it has in the multi layer that you know creates these uh, these wild points and all that, and it becomes uh, a quantum spin hall insulator that has been seen um, actually by Sun Feng, I think, when he was at I, um, MIT back in the day. Um, you know, it exhibits this quantum spin all insulator effect to very high temperatures. So that's very fun. In the multi layer, it was recently predicted that it should be a higher order topological semi metal, that it should actually have hinge states as well. So, you know, we decided to, I did, to come back. It had been many years, but I decided to, to play around with WTE2 again because I think this idea is very fun. And it corresponded with something else I was getting more and more into, which is playing with proximity superconductivity. And so there was a question of, look, in a higher or a topological insulator, it's relatively easy to see a spatially localized conductive state because the bulk is insulated. In a metallic C, so in a semi-metal, how do you tell a metallic hinge state? How do you see one metal state over another metal state in transport? Um, and one of the ideas that we had to try to tackle this was to basically induce superconductivity and use superconductivity as a probe because the superconductivity can be killed, right? With a magnetic field. And as you kill the superconductivity, the spatial dependence, let's say the dimensionality of the superconductivity can result in essentially robustness to magnetic field in different ways. As in a 1D nanowire, uh, it doesn't necessarily get killed at the same magnetic field as a 2D plane of the same material. Uh, and you'll see the analogy in a minute of how we use that. So we, we went ahead and did this. We made Josephson junctions, which is where you take a, your material, tungsten telluride, a slab of it, and we coated 
uh, niobium in two electrodes uh, on top. And you know, through the proximity effect, we proximitize the tungsten ditelluride into superconducting. And then we said, okay, let's look at the uh, current versus phase, the, the critical current versus applied magnetic field um, pattern. Now, in a normal, um, fully proximitized uh, bulk superconductor, as you increase the magnetic field in this JJ, you would exhibit the so-called Fraunhofer diffraction pattern, basically this type of pattern that is analogous to optical diffraction, where you have this oscillatory decay uh, in an overall 1 over B envelope. And if you take the inverse Fourier transform, for example, you'll literally see that it looks like the current is uniformly distributed in your, in your slab in left and right if the, uh, if the magnetic field is applied. Um, sorry, I forgot to draw it here, but out of plane. So that's if you have a bulk. Um, now, if you have other states, so in this case, let's edge or uh, hinge states, you know, with, uh, again, an out of plane magnetic field, what you would expect, which has been seen in uh, other materials as well, is that you would have the Fraunhofer pattern, but also you would have a squid-like pattern on top of it due to Josephson coupling of the two edge states. Um, and if you take the inverse Fourier transform of that, I'm gonna speed up here a bit actually to make sure I finish on time. If you take the inverse Fourier transform of that, you'd expect to see a uh, current enhancement at the edges. And you know, sure enough, that's what we saw. But then there's a question of, is it an edge state or is it a hinge state? And how do you further tell the difference? So there are a few ways to try to tackle that. But one of the ways we did, um, since we actually didn't have such <laughs> easily uh, manipulable magnetic field uh, vectors, what we did is we said, look, if we backfill, if we take our crystal and backfill some way up the sides of the uh, sample with an insulator so that we block contact of the niobium to the, let's say, bottom hinges, they can only contact the top hinges, then, you know, by theory, the hinge states were only exposed to exist on, you know, certain hinges. So if we disallowed the niobium from connecting so that it only contacted one hinge, then this scenario would look different than the edge state scenario, where essentially there is no difference between backfilling and just the completely uh, normal JJ all the way down. Because regardless of whether you connect part way down, uh, part way down or all the way down, you're still contacting both edges. So you would, in this case, has still have your squid pad. In the hinge state case, you would not because you'd only connect one of the nanowires essentially. So we tried it and uh, sure enough, we found that in this device or this type of device rather, we of course did a lot, um, you return back to the expected um, Fraunhofer diffraction pattern without the squid. So you only see the squid pattern in uh, when you connect to both the top and bottom. So in this way, we were able to tell the difference between the hinges and the edges and, it, and confirm that WD2 does you know, appear to have these hinge states. Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna pick up the pace just a little bit because I wanna make sure uh, there's some time for questions and I don't wanna go over. I think I have about 10, 12 minutes left. Yeah, that's so, right. Um, okay, great. So uh, coming up to one of the next things that I, that I think is, which one of my favorite topics actually right now is, uh, is looking at so-called immersion behavior. I'm really getting into this idea of looking at um, materials that combine topology and you know, frustrated magnetism or superconductivity or multiple, uh, strong correlation, you know, multiple of these types of traits, material traits, if it, if it has multiple traits, maybe it can have an emergent property that didn't come from any one of those single traits by themselves. So the Kagome net is a darn good place to look for this because it's already known to you know, host a variety of types of material traits depending on the, uh, the engineering of the, of the lattice, you know, what elements you put inside. So our first crack at this was to look at the combination of a Dirac semi-metal with you know, a possible spin liquid frustrated magnetic state. And, uh, it just so happened that there came out a new material that satisfied this request um, by our collaborators at Santa Barbara back in 2019. Um, at the time, they didn't know that it was a one minus X tier, but that has since been verified. But um, overall, the idea is that it has, again, a Kagome net, but this time of vanadium in a layered fashion. These are 
big old potassiums in between the layers. So it's very nicely exfoliatable and uh, it's very actually stable to, to exfoliation, which is nice. And you know, from there in magnetic investigations, it doesn't appear to have long range magnetic garter down to low temperature. And through our investigations, we said, okay, let's take a look at the electronic structure. And so we, you know, we took their samples and we did some ARPES and found that, you know, ma matches the electronic structure um, pretty closely and that you end up with these pretty sharp linear dispersive bands. You know, it should have pretty, let's say low effective mass, high mobility. So, uh, Mansur, you know, yeah. Uh, one quick question. Here, yeah. uh, when you're talking about Dirac and uh, quantum spin liquid, you are assuming there are two different uh, degrees of freedom, one spin from vanadium and uh, iterant electrons from potassium. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That was the idea. Yeah. Thanks. Now, whether or not that is, you know, completely true in the in the end is still is something that's being investigated. But that was the uh, the initial idea. That was the hope. And so that's how why we got started. OK, thanks. But a uh, good question. Correct. Good question. Um, it's an important point, and it will lead to something that I, you know, want I, that the entire field needs to look at because quantum um, spin liquid um, theory has mostly been only concerned with uh, the localized model. But what happens in this game where you have, let's say, independent sub lattices mm -hmm. um, that can do exactly what you just said? Um, the, the situation is not fully fleshed out as far as I understand because I tried to go looking for theory help. Um, and what is so this, it's, it's an interesting point. What is the spin of vanadium? Oh well, it was ideally it was supposed to be spin half. Okay. Um, by the uh, by the the counting, but again, you know, there there's stuff going on. It's it's an interesting <laughs> question because especially okay. of this potassium dependence. Um, okay. I'll mention briefly at the end what I mean by that. Um, okay. okay. Thanks. Good question though. Thank you. Uh, so. Again, this was the logic. Uh, what you just explained was let's 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 take a look at what happens when you have a material that combines these two um, ideas. And luckily for us, it was very exfoliatable, so we could make you know our typical device of that. So you know, one of the first things you do when you start looking at the transport is, of course, the Hall effect. And uh, we noticed it was weird, right? It's just weird looking. You have a low field, little sideways S, which of course caught our attention. And then in high field, it's clearly you know you have a hump and then some you know, probably shouldn't have the Haas oscillations and nearly saturation or something happening that um, luckily is temperature dependent and appears to come from the ordinary Hall effect. You know, it's too bad. Um, but as you increase temperature, it stay, it, be it becomes one carrier type dominated. Uh, and the important takeaway from this, oh, two things. One, like I said, it was rather high uh, conductivity as we hoped. The effective mass was, it's not written here, but it was around like one eighth uh, ME, so it was, you know, the direct bands came into play. And the low, the low field hump stayed, um, even as we transitioned into a, you know, one carrier type uh, regime. And, you know, it was apparently a non-spontaneous Hall effect, right? So really quickly, I'm going to skim over this, but the Hall effect, I think everybody here knows a great deal about it. Um, there's intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms, of course, uh, just like the spin Hall effect. Um, but the, the extrinsic mechanism uh, the skew scattering mechanism can dominate when you're in the clean regime where you get to very high conductivities. And this comes from scattering off of essentially a, a magnetic sublattice. So either a uh, lack, either a magnetic impurity um, in an otherwise magnetic sublattice or a non-magnetic impurity in an otherwise magnetic sublattice, um, condo style. So we'll, we'll get on this. But basically what we found is that KVSB uh, showed a giant extrinsic anomalous Hall effect that, you know, overlapped into the skew scattering regime. And when I say giant, I mean, you know, really it was very large, uh, larger than iron with the similar scaling. Um, the skew scattering constant, uh, you know, a metric to gauge like how, uh, let's say strong the uh, effect is, so what the level of exchange integral is, um, is between, you know, a factor of like five to, to order of magnitude larger than iron, um, it, depending on sample. So yeah, it, it has a very uh, large extrinsic anomalous Hall effect that came about due to the so-called spin cluster mechanism, which happened to be put forward by Nagaosa like six months before we discovered this. Uh, it's very entertaining. The everything I do, if I when once I find it, I then look online and I find Nagaosa wrote a theory paper six months before predicting it. 
Um, so it's an, you know, that's another good place to, to look is in his papers. He's telepathic, right? He can read your mind. Apparently, yeah, or, or vice versa, you know? He puts it out, I don't read on archive, and then I happen to find it anyways. But uh, so the spin cluster idea, I'm not gonna go into it very much. Um, it's, you know, it's, you can read about it uh, in his paper, but basically the idea is that the triangular lattice with spins on it can act as, instead of as independent spins, sort of a, uh, the cluster can act as a compound magnetic scattering center. So you can have an enhancement to the, to the, to the scattering cross section. And uh, we think that's, that's what we see um, in KBSB. Um, to touch on that point earlier about what's really going on with the magnetism, it's a very interesting question uh, that has very recently been investigated a lot. Um, and there's a paper now online from our collaborators actually, hilariously, that shows that in the uh, fully doped or let's say, uh, sorry, undoped version, the stoichiometric KVSB, there does not appear to be a significant uh, magnetic moment in the, in the entire compound. Um, uh, so it's, it's an interesting question that what is happening in the one minus X that we measure, um, which we've measured a few times in a variety of ways now, and we keep on seeing what appears to be uh, the effect of, of some type of magnetic ordering. Or, uh, oh, sorry, not ordering, but some type of remnant magnetism. So I think there's some very, very interesting work to be done. Um, also, intrinsic superconductivity has been seen now in the fully doped, ver or sorry, the undoped version, the stoichiometric version. And in the, again, the one minus X, we find that when we proximitize with JJs, it looks like it's converting spin singlet injection into spin triplet. So, you know, which has been seen again in materials that have non-collinear canted magnetism, which would make sense and fit with our uh, Hall effect, um, you know, result as well. So there's some very interesting stuff to look at in this compound. Okay, now the very last topic in the last five minutes here, I'm gonna blitz through, is uh, the dark matter one. Um, I think this is always fun, everybody likes, likes it. So why, <laughs> why, why, why can you tr maybe tie um, you know, quantum materials to dark matter. So uh, I'm not gonna go into what axon insulators are uh, too much from a fundamental level. I'm just gonna say that basically they can be manifested in magnetic TIs. So time reversal symmetry breaking topological insulators. So you might notice the formula of these and these are some magnetic um, TIs or axon insulators right now. Um, MNBI2TE4, MN4BITE7, it sounds very similar to the BI2TE3 topological insulator that we talked about earlier. And that's because it is very similar. It is basically, uh, you know, manganese stuffed, stacking altered version. The, the, the unit, the subunit, the, the, pro, the important subunit, which are the hexagonal bismuth telluride layers, are still there. And um, what ends up happening is that you, uh, due to the symmetry breaking, it enters this regime of so-called, you know, axon uh, insulators, where basically you can have a quantized magnetoelectric effect. There's a Chern-Simons term, which you know is the theta um, b dot e, where theta is uh, the same actually theta as a Wilczek's axionic field, um, pseudoscalar field that he describes. Uh, as being possibly related to, or possibly a cause of dark matter. So I'll go through that in a second. But just keep in mind that, you know, these magnetic TIs, these axon insulators can host essentially axion-like excitations, axion quasi-particles. Not necessarily the dark axion, but an, an analog. And that's the important part. So dark matter, of course, um, what the heck is it? We don't know. <laughs> um, it was first hypothesized a long time ago because you know, cosmologists were looking at uh, faraway galaxies and were trying to basically understand the mass of those uh, galaxies and use two different approaches. They were looking either at the amount of light they were giving off, but they were also looking at the rotation speed. And they found that the two did not match. The, the, the amount of mass didn't, didn't make sense. Um, they basically spun too fast for the amount of light they were giving off. And so this led to the, the dark matter um, question. And, you know, more recently from the cosmic microwave background um, experiments, it's now uh, known that we roughly 80% of the mass of the universe is non-luminous matter, that, which is a fancy way of saying we don't know yet, but it doesn't interact with uh, electromagnetic radiation in the, in the same way as what we're used to. 
And that's got to be one of the most compelling statements, I think, to any physicist um, there is. You know, we, we know so much, and yet 80% of the mass, we, ha we don't know. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's strong motivation to work, right? So um, people have been looking uh, for, people have been trying to explain this question of what is dark matter for a long time. Uh, primarily, they looked at WIMPs, the so-called weakly interacting massive particle, which have, most importantly are very heavy. And people looked for this for a long time. People have not seen any evidence of it. So now the, the compass needle is turning towards axons. It's basically the opposite direction. It's an ultra light um, mass. So uh, ADMX is probably the most famous axion um, related search that's just turned on a few, like, few years ago. And basically it is a big microwave cavity. Um, the idea is that if an axion excitation enters this cavity, um, and happens to have a mass that's uh, essentially um, the same that resonates with this cavity, due to the Primkov process, an idea put forward in QCD, in a magnetic field, that axion will spontaneously generate a photon. It'll convert to a photon. So you have a cavity of the right size of the dark axion to, to, uh, to you know, resonate with the mass of the dark axion. If it's there, in the magnetic field, it'll turn into a, a photon and you can detect it. So that's you know a great idea, but it has a couple of drawbacks, right? The a three, a three micro EV axon needs a roughly a one meter cubic resonance condition. That's okay, but if you want to detect an MEV axon, you would need basically a swimming pool evacuated with a uniform magnetic field, um, aligned with photon detectors, single photon detectors everywhere. It's not it's not trivial. It's really really not trivial. So we had an idea. You know what about coupling to the fake axion, the analog axion, axion quasi-particle in an axion insulator. Basically, we said, look, in, in the, X, in the um, magnetic TI, this, the magnitude, the mass of the axion um, excitation, the quasi-particle, is related to the oscillations of the magnetic sublattice, i.e. the spin wave. So in antiferromagnets, this is in the terahertz regime, i.e. the MEV regime. So we said, look, here's the, here's the trick. What if we have our material that hosts a fake axion and it happens to have a mass that is tunable with external magnetic field and it lies in the MeV range. If a dark axion also in the MeV range hits our material, instead of you know, being um, a cavity resonance, it'll resonate, it'll excite the uh, resonantly coupled with our analog axion and similarly make an excitation that at the edge of the boundary of the crystal in a magnetic field will also is turn into a photon. And so, you know, we can then detect that photon. So the, the idea is basically to shift the resonance condition from the electric field in empty space to the spin wave in our magnetic sublattice and get away from having to have a swimming pool. So, you know, for relatively conservatively sized, um, you know, a, hundred, a meter, let's say a meter cube of array of material, you know, we believe that we can pierce the red line. What is the red line? The red line is the QCD predictions of where dark matter, the dark axon would be in terms of coupling to mass. And, uh, you know, ADMX may, was very famous because it's the first actually experiment that pierces that line um, that, that's turned on. But again, you're limited, you can't tune. You, whatever your cavity is that you made, that's, that's the mass you can measure and you can't really tune around that very much. Uh, we think in this idea, you know, since it's tied, the resonance is tied to the magnetic field strength, within some magnetic field strength that you don't spin flip your, your material, you can tune. You can tune quite a bit. So that's, that's too rad. <laughs> I didn't name it, but that's the name that it got. Uh, too rad, the topological resin axion detection. So baby steps, of course. Uh, the last slide. Before uh, making a dark matter detector, although we're in the process of starting to do that, you know, prove that you have this dynamical axion um, quasi-particle. So one way to do that is, of course, just spec terahertz spectroscopy. Um, what we're saying is that if you have this material that hosts a MEV, you know, uh, axion analog, if you do the inverse of the Primkov process, if we shine light on the material with the right wavelength, uh, we'll get absorbance um, by this axion polariton excitation. So if you imagine sweeping through the, uh, the transmission or you know, coefficient as a function of uh, irradiative um, energy, there should be a gap or at least a dip 
related to the uh, axon polariton mass. So we are literally doing this experiment now um, in Italy, and let's see what happens. But you know, that's the first step. If that works, then it's on to building the dark matter detector. So, um, oh, sorry. Like I said, two rad. Uh, this is the team, the the principal members, um, the cosmologist in question who has done most of this was David James Edward Marsh, a good friend of mine. Um, and we, we, we started this a few years ago and everybody else joined in. Ooh. Other people I have to acknowledge, of course, are uh, people who've been very helpful, including my group members. Um, now, Dr. Shoying Yang, uh, she recently graduated and we're all very proud, summa cum laude. My first student, actually. And then uh, postdocs, Yao Jia, uh, Mosin, other grad students, Jiho, um, and Elena, and other friends. So. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks a lot. Um, so that's, that's a, that was a very interesting talk. Um, so we're, we're now open for questions. I, I see Mehdi has a question. Just please unmute yourself and ask. Hello. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was really great. And I have two questions. The first question is about the um, semi-metal. So uh, there you mentioned that uh, you break time reversal symmetry and some point group symmetry. And could you elaborate a little bit more about the point group symmetry you make with, uh, break? Because uh, here, uh, maybe it was a coincidence, like I always see you break either C3 or C4 symmetry. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think the question was, asking um, what uh, symmetry is broken in, in tungsten ditelluride, basically, uh, about the semi-metal? Yes. Okay. Like, what is the symmetry constraint that like uh, this class of symmetry you can, I can break to get this particular uh, like oh. that? Okay, now I think I get it. Okay, right. Um, so like we were mentioning before, um, point group symmetry uh, can demand um, these types of degeneracies. Um, so, you know, C4, C6 rotation, as well as reflection uh, can also do this. Um, and those can, you know, help you get to, let's say, in the presence of time reversal and inversion symmetry, this can help you make a uh, Dirac semi-metals. If you, and there, there's more than one way to do this now. Um, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, okay? But starting from that, point. If you want to immediately try to go to being a while semi-metal, where you have um, spin up and spin down and no longer degenerate, for example, then you would want to break either inversion or time reversal symmetry. So in tungsten ditelluride, it is actually bro breaking inversion symmetry. It's non-magnetic tungsten. Um, so it's not, it, it's preserving time reversal symmetry in this particular lattice. But in, along the C-axis, due to the layer stacking, um, which maybe I'll try to rapidly go show, it breaks, um, it loses its center of inversion that ah, here. So it's, oh yeah, it's, it's not really easy to see here, but due to this layer stacking, um, it has a, a yeah, it, it loses inversion. Um, it does have a, a glide plane, though, that repins a uh, crossing. Yeah, I um, think there's a bit of a lag right now, and we can't really see the specific screen that, yeah. So oh, I'm sorry. A little bit of time to get to, or, um, okay. yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think, I mean, anyways, we're, we're, I, I'll, I'll end the question there. there. I think, um, yeah, I think it doesn't, unfortunately, this slide actually doesn't show too much. So I'll just end the question with saying, uh, basically, here we broke inversion symmetry. Um, rather than time reversal for this specific material. Okay. I see. Um, so can I ask the second question? So uh, it's very quick. So uh, usually in a um, cargo lattice, we are used to that. Uh, like if it's like first nearest neighbor, we'll have the flat band at the top. But here I see that the flat band is the very bottom, and which is sometimes very desirable. So uh, could you elaborate a little bit more? Like uh, what was the mechanism to just flip? Uh, well, put it from the top to the bottom because uh, it's quite like uh, sought after in some field like in cold at home. We actually look for this kind of behavior because then we right. can load them at the ground state very easily. Right. Um, so first off, 
it's not uh, necessarily clear that it's been seen in um, KVSB, the, the, the flat band. Um, I think this figure I took from the Iron 3 tin paper maybe, um, where they claim that happens uh, due to basically particular orbital filling. Um, so I can't really elaborate too much on the theoretical reason as to why it ended up basically upside down. Um, mm -hmm. It's just not my area of expertise, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem, but thanks again sure. for the nice talk. Oh, thank you. Is there any more questions? From students, postdocs? I yeah. thought I saw. Yeah. Ah. Bent is a question, please. Please ask a question. So Bent, you're, you're, you're still muted. Um, maybe you could unmute yourself. Yes, I only switched on the camera. Sorry. Thanks, Marza, for a very, very exciting talk. Uh, I was interested you. in the uh, Josephson Junction uh, experiment. Right. Um, of thanks, Natalia, right. So, uh, so my first, actually two questions. My first question was, you mentioned that the uh, critical field might be enhanced on the uh, helical hinge. So do you see an indication of that? And what, what would be the critical field? Ah. So, yeah, um, you know, if I take the critical field as the field at which the squid oscillation is lost, because even that superconductivity is suppressed, then it persisted um, up to, I think, in, in our best device, I think it got up to like 350 gauss. So, you know, it just kept going for a little way for, well, almost twice as far um, as in this, uh, is in this figure here. Um, okay. Mm. Yeah. But is, is that also limited by the, the kind of superconductor that you use uh, to pro proximitize or? For sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, in no way is this an optimized engineered device. Absolutely. You know, if you used a basically different superconductor, you know, you could definitely tune that, right? We use niobium um, type two, you know, has some penetration, you know, yeah. Um, and it, it, it but it, it's not bad. But if you're really, if you were trying to optimize, if you were trying to say, I want to make as high as a critical field as possible, absolutely, it, it's definitely going to be dependent on the uh, electrode, the superconductive electrode you choose, and it's um, essentially coupling. You know, the, the transparency, uh, its its interface, and um, you know, the corresponding proximity effect, which is highly determined by that that interface. Um, Okay, sure, understand. Um, the, the second question I had was, uh, so this signature of the helical hinge, do you hmm. see that on all facets of your uh, tungsten titanium crystal or what, what happens on other edges, for example? Does this very good, <laughs> very good question. And yes, uh, it was supposed to be anisotropic. It was supposed to be that the hinge states propagate um, without much, uh, let's say, mixing with the bulk along the A axis, as in it should have mixed a lot with, uh, in the, along the B axis. And we did experiments where we put the electrodes this way versus where we put the electrodes, it's hard for me to draw, but you know, this way, okay? Or actually it's drawn here, you know, along the B axis versus along the A axis. And sure enough, we did see that. We found that along the B axis, uh, sorry, along, okay, don't worry about it. The point is, you know, uh, orthogonal to the hinge states, we do see a huge difference in the, the Fraunhofer pattern, and we don't see uh, the, the same squid coupling um, as expected because these supposed hinge states uh, along in this direction should be lost by mixing into the bulk. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> Have you tried uh, doing those experiments on monolayers as well, or...? So how does nope. that, I guess Just, I'm, I'm, <laughs> somebody should, <laughs> you know, you, cause you could gate tune the monolayer right into intrinsic superconductivity. And then you maybe don't even need the superconducting electrodes, maybe just put gold and look to see if, you know, uh, these interesting states still exist analogous to the ONG work. Um, so we actually have a news and views where we review, there were four papers that, that were published within a few months of each other that all tackled the same, you know, discussion. Um, we did WT2, Ong did molybdenum ditelluride, and a couple others uh, did tungsten ditelluride, but in other ways. 
And everybody kind of saw more or less the same stuff. Um, Ong, in particular, saw this sort of squid pattern, though, with gold electrodes um, in MOT2 that intrinsically superconducted. So there's an interesting question as to what the heck is exactly going on uh, there. Because, yeah, OK, I, you know, OK, we could talk about that later. Um, but it's a very interesting question as to what he saw. <laughs> what exactly did he see? But um, yeah, the modeler hasn't been done. I don't intend to do it. I'm, I'm doing other things. You know, this was my, I like to take one crack on an interesting question and then I sort of move on to another interesting question for me. So I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> Understand, yeah, thanks. So yeah, once yeah. again, thanks. It was really, really interesting. No, oh, thank you. So some more questions, um, students, postdocs. If not, I have, uh, may I ask another question? Yes, sure, of course. Mm. Well, sir, uh, going back to KVSB, mm -hmm. uh, so now the, uh, the two degrees of freedom come from two different atoms. What is the, uh, if I uh, am allowed to use a theorist language, what is the condo lattice model? Is it Kagome um, all along yeah. or? Yeah, the idea initially, again, um, was that it was like a, it was a, we were trying to apply the, the Kagome model. Um, so okay. nothing, nothing unique there. Okay. Again, whether that's true or not, it looks to me like it's not true. <laughs> it doesn't apply, actually. So it's, in, like I said, it's an interesting area of investigation, what's going on in this compound. Um, but, but that was the initial hypothesis. I see. And uh, one related question is, when, when it's doped away from uh, stoichiometric uh, hmm. ratio, uh, uh, one minus X. Is, is there any evidence of the Kagome that is being distorted to say breathing Kagome or anything like that? That might explain that you have right. a net magnetic moment. Yeah, very good point. Very interesting question. Um, at the moment, there is not. Uh, these guys did neutron, um, our collaborators down to quite low temperature. Mm -hmm. um, below, of course, where we measured the anomalous Hall effect. That was, you know, an order of magnitude larger temperature than this. And they don't see um, evidence of distortion. That I said, see. See. Hassan recently did STM, um, also published I or put online in like December after we put on another paper. And he says that he sees chiral charge ordering at very low temperatures. I forget, I forgot the temperature range, but uh, yeah, that there's some sort of charge density wave formation is what he says he sees that is apparently chiral. So maybe, you know, I think, I think you're thinking along the right lines, I think, and that might be, you know, part of it. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, thank like you. I said, it's, it's, a, it's a hot area to look at. There's, there's so many interesting questions. Uh, and thanks a lot again for the excellent talk. Thank you. Sure, thank you, thank you. So um, with that, I, I think we probably should close you out right now uh, because you've got um, these meetings afterwards. But um, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, and let's, um, let's thank um, Mazur again. You know. <laughs> thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you all for listening. And I guess I'll talk to some of you throughout the day. So thank you. Take care. <laughs>